just for talking to you about the projects you're working on, um, it seems like this would be a nice kind of place where you could practice a little bit or at least take some ideas and apply it to the data set you're working on. So the plan is um, I'm going to show you a couple example findings of how we've used uh, the concept of synchrony or alignment in, in our work. And then um, we're going to then dive into code and you're welcome to actually just like follow along the code on the screen or you could do it yourself on your laptop um, on uh, how to do it. Okay. So most of this is just going to be about synchrony and we're going to uh, primarily look at like when you're watching a movie and specifically Friday Night Lights, which is one that Eshin talked about in his talk on Tuesday. Um, <clears throat> we started this project, uh, I think right when I got here in 2015, and then we spent the first year in our lab arguing about which show to pick. And the original idea was to scan an entire season of a show. Uh, and then we all would like pick one and we'd watch it and then we'd argue about why it was terrible or not. Um, and eventually this was the one that somehow made it, although it wasn't in full agreement and now we're stuck with it probably for the rest of my life. Um, so yeah, so Eshin and Jin, um, who were graduates since the time, kind of like built this whole thing, designed it and collected all the data and have been analyzing it. And you saw some of Eshin's dissertation work where he's built on this. And then um, Jeremy um, has like basically helped provide all of the conceptual and analytic kind of expertise and, and we've developed together. And actually a lot of these analyses and things that we did came from iterations of mine previous years where we got some ideas and tried to implement it or worked on it as hack project and stuff. Okay, so movie watching, most of you guys have seen that this is like a pretty popular thing these days where you just scan people watching movies so you don't have to be very clever about experiments. Um, so we did that as well. Um, and in this one, People uh, watch the show and there's different parts. And the reason we picked the show is partly because it's a character-driven drama. So there's a lot of characters that we follow. And so you got to see how we use that in some of Eshin's work. And in this one um, project, we were really interested in looking at affect. And you can see that people are very exuberant, uh, some <laughs> like incredibly so, uh, of some of the events that unfold. So this is this game-winning touchdown um, at the end of the first uh, the pilot episode. Um, and then there's other people, there's a lot of individuation. So there's other people who are like less uh, excited when the quarterback throws this like game winning pass and, and a bit more amused when he throws, messes up and hits his teammate in the back. <laughs> um, okay, so the, one of the first questions we were interested in is like, like a lot of the stuff we had these ideas and we'd notice things when people present talks or in their papers and the labs that were doing a lot of this intersubject correlations and um, hyperalignment and things that are all kind of derivatives of the same concept, where it, that is that people have some underlying commonality, common experience to watching a the same um, input stimulus, was that from Uri's Hassan's framing is that any variations across people is likely to be noise. So any of the real signal are going to be things that are common across people. And so he is been working on this for decades and has done amazing work that's inspired much of the stuff in our labs and many others. Um, but you don't really, I don't really believe anything until I see it myself. So we collect our own data and just wanted to test this and see if we replicated their findings. So how this works is we basically just take, there's a lot of ways to do this. We're just doing average activity within an ROI. Um, so this is um, early visual cortex and each line here is a different subject watching the movie and we have them watch for 45 minutes. Um, and you can see that they're kind of, um, you know, going, uh, the activity in this region is is, is quite uh, dynamically time-locked to each other in this region across participants. Um, and the way that this is typically quantified in intersubject correlation is that you do the, there's there's basically two ways to do it. Um, so one is that you do the pairwise um, correlations or similarity of the participants. So you get this like correlation matrix, essentially. This is just the upper half of it. Um, and then you can just summarize this with like the mean or the median to, to say the overall amount of reliability of the, of the signal in this region across participants. Um, another way to do it is you take one subject and you take the correlation of their subject with the average of others. And so then you just loop over and you just take the mean. So you have basically a degrees of freedom in number of subjects. Um, that's another popular approach. I personally don't tend to recommend it because I think you lose some things and it inflates your R values a little bit. Um, and the structure of how people co-vary across dyads um, might be interesting as well that that approach loses. So we just tend to do this other approach, but it's not the only way to do it. Um, and so if you iterate over the whole brain, what we find, which is what many others have found, is that you see um, a, a, the highest reliability, the highest synchronization across participants in these unimodal like primary sensory regions. So like primary auditory, primary visual, 
Um, if we had uh, motor activity in this task, I, just, I assume that would happen as well. But as um, information kind of propagates more to um, higher order cortex that is, is more association cortex or transmodal as or heteromodal as it's sometimes called, um, we see that the synchronization drops quite a bit and particularly in the prefrontal cortex and, and limbic regions. So why does this happen? So we replicated this across other uh, multiple data sets. Um, uh, but they were both with Friday Night Lights. So you might be like, okay, well, what if you watched a different movie or a different stimulus? So we had an undergrad thesis where she did a, a, a meta-analysis across, I think we have maybe 40 or 50 studies now in it. At the time, it was only about a little under 40, where we just got their, their overall ISC maps across all these different stimulus. So some of them are pure auditory, some of them are listening to music, some of them are different types of movies, and they're collected from all over the world. And we see basically it's the same effect as highly consistent and preserved um, across these studies. Um, and we can like zoom in and, and break it out a little bit. So for example, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex um, is actually statistically significant from zero, meaning there's some degree of synchronization. Um, that's one of the regions we're focusing on to show that synchrony isn't equivalent across the brain. But the magnitude of that effect is equivalent to how much the visual cortex synchronizes when you're listening to a purely auditory study. Um, so this is when it's a video study in visual cortex and then when it's auditory, visual synchrony drops. But the magnitude of that is comparable to what we're seeing in other parts of the brain. So another um, potential confound is like, oh, okay, well, you're doing fMRI. Um, for those who, who do that and know it pretty well, uh, that particular region um, has a lot of artifacts coming from um, what's called susceptibility artifacts. So anywhere where tissue borders air uh, creates these distortions in the magnetic field, um, and you get signal dropout, but also um, uh, distortion there. So to rule that out, we went to another modality. So this is um, uh, doing in collaboration with our epilepsy monitoring group and uh, at Dartmouth Hitchcock, uh, we recorded um, patients with um, intractable epilepsy while they were undergoing um, uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation for surgical intervention. So basically they come into the hospital, they have their skulls removed, they have depth electrodes um, placed uh, you know, in, in target locations throughout the brain. And then they're stuck in a hospital with all these cords coming out of the back of the head for like a week or so. And the, the neurologists are trying, the neurosurgeons are trying to figure out where are the, um, the seizures coming from in deeper locations. So when they're planning their surgical interventions, they, they, don't, they try to like minimize damage to, to the rest of the brain. Um, but the patients are quite bored in there and they can't do much. So they're usually quite happy to participate in the study, especially if it's just going to be laying in bed watching TV, which is what they're actually just doing anyway. Um, so this project was led by our, our uh, a grad, a student who just graduated and is now, I think, this as of today, maybe starting at Amazon um, as a, a, a research scientist there. So what we did is we looked at local field potential, specifically in the orbital frontal cortex, uh, and you can look across frequency bands or just to quickly simplify, if we just do broadband or the average act um, across all frequency bands, we see that in unimodal cortex, so here it's now primary auditory rather than visual, we see um, uh, we can replicate that people are synchronizing and that this corresponds to the audio envelope of the stimuli that's happening, the auditory stimulus. But in ventral media prefrontal cortex, we see um, virtually no degree of, of, of synchrony there as well. So it doesn't seem to be just um, uh, an artifact of fMRI, which is, I think, interesting. Um, so, let's see how much time do I have? Okay, turn aside. <laughs> so we can just stop there with synchrony, or we can go a little deeper and try to figure out why is this happening. And I think I'll try, I might skip through some of this and show selectively a few things. But one way we've tried to look at this is say, Okay, so let's assume information of, of the processes happening in the brain at a particular moment in time um, is represented in a spatial pattern. So we can take um, uh, like a mask of the ventral media prefrontal cortex and what the activation is within one subject and then just do a correlation. So when do we see um, uh, that pattern similarity happen over time? So this is just a time by time correlation matrix for the BMPFC um, spatial patterns for a single subject. And you can see that it changes a lot, but there it has this particular structure or block diagonal structure where you see that there will be times where there's a certain um, pattern, but then it persists over time. And some of these you can't really see the active very well, but that's about three minutes for this particular subject. So this it, it enters this, this state for about three minutes and then transitions to some other states quickly and then to a new one. But this one and this one are not the same state. But this one and this one actually are probably the same state given or uh, if assuming that the, the spatial information um, reflects that. So it's the same spatial pattern that seems to be reinstated there. 
Okay, so this is really interesting. So this <clears throat> could be particular, like complete noise or artifacts could be correlated with people falling asleep or not. Although I have studied, I've looked at the resting state data this way too, and it basically looks like something interesting and then nothing for the rest. And that's essentially when they fall asleep. Um, so I don't think it's just that part. It could be something else. So if we start looking at different subjects, we, we see the same pattern kind of um, being manifested, but the, the structure, the particular configuration of it seems to defer quite a bit across participants. Um, and I think that's partly explaining why we're not seeing a high degree of of intersubject correlations in the time series. Um, okay, so I'm going to add one more slide because there's something I wanted to say. <laughs> that I, um, and that is, we, we also looked at the time varying dynamics of synchrony, which is going to be part of the tutorial. So that's what I want to do. Um, so how we did this, <clears throat> so this is two target regions. So one is the ventral media performance, the one I'm talking about, and another one is um, early visual cortex. And what we did here is we took the spatial pattern for each subject at every TR and looked at the alignment or synchrony. I'm kind of using those terms inter interchangeably, but typically people use synchrony in terms of time and alignment for everything else. Um, but I, don't, I think conceptually they're pretty much the same in my mind. Um, and so you see that uh, the spatial patterns are kind of fluctuating up and down quite a bit in, in early visual cortex and considerably less so in ventral media prefrontal cortex. And there's been this really interesting work that's been done at, at Dartmouth led by, and for Princeton and at Dartmouth led by Jim Haxby on um, maybe people's, like when you're in the scanner, we're like um, turning, you know, your continuous brain space into a discrete thing. And maybe voxels aren't quite aligned um, to people. So you can basically, um, okay, sorry. You can realign um, voxels based on common um, temporal synchrony. And this is a technique called hyperalignment um, that Jim has been working on in, for um, the last few years. Um, and you can see that in early visual cortex, this perfectly replicates his work, um, that you get this massive boost in alignment. And this is cross-validated. So this, the, the, the actual alignment process or remapping, this functional alignment mapping, is independent of the data that we're applying it to. Um, but for the BMPFC, you don't see any appreciable um, increase in, in synchronization there or any like, time point either. Okay, go back to where I was. Okay. So if you basically take all the participants of these like um, uh, matrices and stack them and try to see, is there anything consistent across them? Uh, there's basically nothing statistically significant off of the like minimal amount of autocorrelation in the signal. Um, but if we look at other control regions like um, visual cortex, we see a very different pattern. So one, the changes are much faster as we'd expect um, given how the visual system works, but also that those fast changes are highly um, reliably um, or highly consistent across uh, participants. So basically, what's happening here when these changes are happening are not shared across participants, but we're in, in unimodal cortex, they are. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to go pretty quick through this part because it's not as relevant for the tutorial, but I just want to give you a, a bit of a flavor of what you can do if you're looking, trying to study things that aren't temporally aligned, but might be spatially aligned. Um, so how we try to do that was we, this is a time by voxel matrix. So this is basically all the data in the BMPFC vectorized. <clears throat> and we're trying to identify time points for a single subject of, of where uh, they might be in a particular state and if that state is um, re re reoccurs later. And we're doing this by fitting a, a hidden Markov model, which is a, a discrete state space model to, to the data. And then we rerun the model through the data to get a predicted state for um, in time. So every TR for a subject, we know what state they're in um, um, indexed by some type of spatial pattern. And so, when you apply it back to that same subject's um, data, you can see that it's capturing where these changes are happening quite well, and, and it's, it's figuring out that these are the same state as, as we can kind of tell from the correlation matrix. And one of the interesting things we found that wasn't actually anticipated is that the spatial patterns learned by this model, um, which doesn't have a, a time locking assumption in it, or at least a, a subset of the, of the states of the spatial patterns were actually quite similar across participants. So this is the spatial similarity and the these are all the subjects. So some of the states, there's not a lot of similarity across subjects, but two of the states there are. Um, so what this means is that there is some degree of 
of um, spatial information that's preserved across participants, but they in this region of the brain, but they're not necessarily coming on a line with the same exact time or um, we're being reflected by the, the signal. So this could be like a mind wandering thing or it could reflect like preference, individual preferences about what they care about. Like many people might care about the interaction part of the romantic relationships or family dynamics, or they might care about football. And so the show has like a, a, a lot of content in there. So we can try to quantify the using this other metric now that's not necessarily average activity, but um, these discrete states that you might be in and try to get a sense of how many participants are aligning to the same state at the same point in time. And interestingly, in the VMPFC, um, we're rarely seeing alignment at any point in time that's greater than 50% of the sample. And that's across um, two different samples and two different scanners that, that we've looked at. Um, but when they are aligning, they happen to be or they might be at interesting time points. And, and at least for this red blue one, which had the most spatial consistency across participants, they're almost anti correlated or when one goes up, the other one goes down. Um, we've also tried to map this onto our intracranial data and the time resolution of this is a lot faster than fMRI and it doesn't have like the HRF lag, but uh, we largely see that we can replicate some of these um, when subjects are aligning into the same state in local field potentials and also with old fMRI. Okay, so what are these states processing? Um, this is what we spent a lot of time on, and I'm gonna go a little quickly through this, but I think some of these, these um, points uh, reflect some of our discussions yesterday as well about the, the acquiring data, and especially in the self-report side. Um, so we collected other data sets. So people watch uh, the movie outside the scanner, we report the facial expressions, that was one of them. And uh, we basically have, built these ways to record facial expressions where it's basically um, like a motion capture uh, system rig for like people doing animations. Um, but now, honestly, like as, as Mark showed, we're, we're doing a lot of like 360 cameras to record. Um, and then we use computer vision models um, that we basically borrowed from other labs or retrained given the, the papers they reported. Um, and we have like a toolbox now that we'll talk about later in the week on the nonverbal thing. Uh, about how you can apply this to any video to identify faces and extract different features. But this is kind of like the SPM or FSL of face expression. So the idea is you can, you know, acquire data and detect it, but you can also do pre-processing analysis. And we're been slowly adding in different types of visualizations of your data um, with, and trying to make it as at least as simple as like imaging analysis, which I guess it's your perspective that's simple or not. Um, <laughs> okay. So in addition to facial expression, we also elicited self-report. Um, but as you, you, some of you may know, and we also talked about in the self-report um, discussion group, uh, it's really hard to do these like continuous ratings of dimensions. It, it ends up being like a dual task. Um, and so you might, by the act of having to monitor how you're feeling, it might take you out of experience where you actually don't have an emotional experience. So that would be problematic. So our solution of how we're trying to get around this that we've been working on for a few years is to do what we call the sparse sampling technique, where you watch a video or any type of stimuli and it'll pause randomly. And then um, you'll there's like a menu of feelings or it could be you know mental state inferences. It doesn't really matter what the dimensions are. Here we were looking at emotions. Um, and then people just rate how they're feeling at that moment. And we also have like a bar saying how they felt at the last time they rated it. And so what's neat about this is we only, in this particular video, we only asked 12 times. So it's a really, really um, uh, low sample, like frequency sampling. Um, and this gives us this matrix where we have um, all the subjects we scanned, uh, let's say on how, how much joy they're feeling. And that's, so these are subjects going down as rows and columns are, are time points in which um, they, they, we elicit a rating and everything else is a missing data that we don't know what it is. And we also collected a few hundred people online using MTurk using the exact same um, paradigm so we can augment this matrix a little bit with others. So we're kind of covering in time and rows across people. And then um, we've uh, been borrowing techniques used by like Spotify and Amazon and Netflix, um, which is a class of machine learning called collaborative filtering to try to uh, learn a model that can predict the observed data, um, but for the entire time series while still preserving some degree of individual differences. So. The, there's a, we have a number of algorithms implemented, but one of the ones that we've been using, it's, it's non-negative matrix factorization. And it basically essentially is learning like groups or latent factors of people um, that we then use as a basis set to reconstruct a single individual. So this is just an example of once we rerun the model on Joy, and you can go see how it goes from sparse to dense, and then also for sadness. 
And I think you can appreciate the some people are really similar, but then there's other people who are just higher or low overall or have are having a different experience uh, um, than others. Okay, so this I'm not going to go into too much detail. This paper I think came out this year or so, or maybe last year. Um, the validation of this, but we basically recorded some data where we know the ground truth, and then we subsample the data at different levels of sparsity to see how well our algorithms can re re um, recover the missing data and find that our the one that I'm showing you does the best, and it gets probably as close as we're going to be able to given the inherent like noisiness of the signal itself. Um, and this is just an example. If you have, once you reconstruct, you only use 10% of the data. And, and if you compare it to what the true was versus what we can infer on average across participants, and it does actually do a surprisingly good job. And, and the more data you give it, the better and better and better it does. So it's like exactly the same. Okay, so that was a little bit of a roundabout way to get there. But the reason why I wanted to tell you about that is this other analysis we did, this is a different way we can look at synchrony or alignment. So now we have um, two studies where we have these um, like state concordances of how often or how many subjects are in the same state at the same time across two different um, imaging studies. Um, but we also have the facial expressions data and the self-report rating data. And those are all time locked to the movie, even though they're different. Um, so these are like summaries of experiments. And now we can look at degree of synchrony over um, experiments or over measurement modalities. And specifically, um, we're using a technique um, called functional alignment, like this hyperalignment that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so we're trying to uh, like align these across experiments into a latent space. And so this is the result of that. So this is what the time course it learns. It's common across all four of these or all four of these studies. And you can see that like at this time point, which is when there's this the star the star quarterback gets like hit and gets injured and has to carry off the chair uh, off the field, goes to the hospital and ends up being a quadriplegic. Um, and then, so that, that's in that particular state, you can kind of see it's reflected in the brain. Um, and then there's this other one that comes on when that game winning touchdown, when the, the, some of the participants were very excited um, that scene I showed you in the very beginning. Okay, and what's neat about this is not only is it allowing you to assess the synchrony in this latent space across any type of measure modality, essentially, um, but you can also get, um, how do you take the data from one modality and project it into this common space? So for the facial expression, I think this is really intuitive because it's like, what are the facial muscles that are um, measured through their computer vision techniques um, that are associated with these um, time courses? And the first one, the red one, is like a more of a smiling behavior. So you can see it goes up when the game went touchdown. Um, and then this other one is more of like a like kind of surprise concern, worry concern. Uh, uh, where the eyes are opening, the mouth might be dropping. Um, and that's going up when he gets injured. Um, and then at the same time, we can do that as before uh, our sub self report feelings. You can see these are largely much more positive, like hope, cry, joy. And these are um, tend to be more negative, like sadness, fear, um, interest. And these two, uh, we don't see a lot of alignment across participants. So I, I'm just ignoring this for a second. So this is also using a different way of doing synchrony or alignment, um, but across experiments. Okay. And I'm going to skip this, even though I was talking to how you, uh, I'm. Monday or Tuesday about how this is our favorite part of this paper. Um, and it, I like it a lot too, but I'm just gonna skip it for now. Um, okay. So, okay, I just told you this whole thing about synchrony and we're watching a movie and that might be really interesting to take these techniques and apply to your data, but this is interacting mind. So what happens if like two people are watching, do you see more synchrony? And we haven't done the imaging version of that. That's something we're just starting to work on now. Um, we, we have a recent grant to study it, but this was sort of the pilot data for the grant of where we did it just uh, behavior, so looking at psychophys and, and facial expressions, um, watching Friday Night Lights as well. Um, so this was part of um, uh, uh, Jin's uh, dissertation. So basically the design was we had uh, participants come and watch uh, four episodes of Friday Night Lights. So that's similar to Ashton's study, but they watched it all outside the scanner. And one group of them watched them by themselves. So those are the sort of the videos you saw before. And another group came, they were essentially strangers um, who watched it next to each other side by side and recorded all of their facial expressions. Um, so this is a interesting scene where the girlfriend and the best friend of the quarterback who gets injured, they're struggling. He feels guilty because he thinks he may have missed a block uh, that caused the spot, you know, him, his best friend to get injured and be in the hospital. Um, his girlfriend is like trying to be really supportive of the of the quarterback and is being really frustrated, everybody, that they're not doing it. And it's looking more hopeless, like he's not going to regain um, being able to walk. And so they're kind of arguing and having an emotional thing. And then obviously you can see 
it turns into something else. Um, and uh, but depending if you're watching by yourself or with other people, uh, people have kind of different responses. So that you can see over here, like some people start like smiling and get excited, and over here they're like horrified. <laughs> like, what's that? Um, so there, we saw some hints, although we didn't really find a, a great way to quantify it to, to the when we went to reports. That's the people in the paper, but there might be some when you're in a social context, the moral um, stuff might shift at you a little bit, um, which is pretty interesting. Okay, so what I want to show you now is we can look at synchronization of lots of different features that we've collected. So the first one I'm going to show you is um, like when they're making facial expressions that are either positive or negative. So basically smiling or frowning or um, or being angry or concerned, like it's brow furrowing. And overall, we see that the level of synchronization um, to the dyads is higher for every episode you watch compared to uh, like random pairs of people who watch it by themselves. Um, and it's greater for positive things like smiling compared to more negative um, facial expressions. And this also might be a social context or modulate a social context in the sense that these are strangers and it might be more socially appropriate to say show smiling rather than like other things. And as you get to know someone that might change also. Um, we can also, so this is overall, this is just using intersubject correlation like we talked about. And you can also look at time varying synchrony. So I think, I can't remember exactly. I think this is a, a moving average approach. Um, we're going to use show examples of a slightly different one in the tutorial, um, but you can see there are certain time points where the dyads and the loans like deviate a lot more, um, and so most of them are like where the most the most engaging or uh, like emotional scenes, but some of them are also the, these like like more social or socially ambiguous scenes too, which I think is really interesting. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, so sorry. Uh, is this somehow controlled for the amplitude? Like the difference in diets versus um, individual watching and how strongly they show. Yeah, okay, so it doesn't fully control for that. Um, it is a little bit higher, but it might be, it's it's not on average as I recall, although I could be wrong. It's in the, that, that's in the paper, I just don't remember that detail. Um, I don't think it's higher on average. No, it is slightly higher on average. That's what this is showing, sorry. This, to get the synchrony higher, it means also that you have more variation. Um, and so I think the amplitude is higher. It's a little bit hard to do because we are z scoring it. It's like when you're doing a correlation, you're already removing the mean. So it's a little hard to infer that from these. But I do believe there's a slight effect. But it's really an interactive one where in some points in time, it's massively higher. And in other points, it's not for the amplitude and also for synchrony. Thinking that you kind of have more signal when you have a higher amplitude, right? And yeah. Higher. Synchrony is probably easier when you have a higher amplitude. Yeah, it should be given the variation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you see that to some degree. Yeah. It's looking at each other or what's the setup? It's, it varies across dyads. So they're like essentially like a lot like you and Tessa. They're watching a screen sitting right next to each other, but they have these like, like PVC pipes coming out of their head from a wrestling helmet with a GoPro in the front so they could turn, but then they might run into each other. But they do, they are doing like some utterances, like they're definitely like giggling or laughing, or sometimes they just straight up start talking and having a conversation. We didn't put any constraints on that. Um, and then sometimes I think they can kind of glance at each other a little bit, but it's not as easy. And we don't have a great way for this particular study to assess that. Um, yeah. We know each other. Um, most of them don't. I think there's one or two diets to do, and all of it, they don't seem to impact the results that much. Yeah, yeah. But we are, like you saw the chat app thing that from some of we see this work about what are they talking about when and that, that type of stuff to see. Well, just as you would expect, that there would be a lot of like looking at each other. Yeah. Right? Ability to do so, but definitely, and I think it, that, without that too, and I think it, it will increase over time as you get to know more comfortable with each other too, and you start to have these like inside things that you've shared, like a, from the like conceptual alignment, like in iron stuff, or what Robert was talking about earlier this morning. Okay, so the the synchrony, how much you're synchronizing in this positive expression, actually predicts how connected you feel to your partner, and that grows over time after each episode. So the more time you spend together, that relationship gets stronger. Um, but that doesn't seem to be true for the negative expressions, um, at least in this data set. Um, we can also look at how people are, are synchronizing in, in their facial expression. So it's not just as a, as a smile or a frown, um, but we can also see what are the, the, the actual facial expressions and are they more similar for maybe positive or negative ones? So in this one, we're also using this functional alignment technique. And we're and so instead of using FRI, we're using facial expression data. 
And we're trying to find a latent kind course that's common across all people. So you can imagine like, um, you know, upcoming election, which is terrifying. We had a past elections, which were also horrifying and terrifying, but there's different sets of the population that are time locked to the same event that might be going up or down of how happy they are. And that would, uh, if you were averaging all those people, you would see like zero synchrony there, but they might actually be synchronizing. They're just in different ways. And so that's what this technique is like, really interesting for. So these are the facial expressions it learns from each participant that projects into uh, these latent time courses. And so these are largely positive ones and these are negative ones. The negative ones are sometimes like, um, like look more like sad or more like, ang like angry or concerned, or they might be like eyes widening here, like your, your eyebrows going up. So these are all technically negative, but they're much more varying than these smiling ones. And the degree to which people synchronize here also predicts their social connection. And then finally, or maybe not finally, um, there's a, we looked at psychophys and so specifically electrodermal activity or skin conductance. And we see the same type of thing. People synchronize more in this measure when they're watching with another person compared to by themselves. Um, and interestingly though, compared to the positive file, uh, facial expressions, it's at different time points. So these are more than negative ones. So like when the, the, the star quarterback gets hit right away, you see a lot of um, increased synchrony in the dyads there at that time point and a lot of the other negative ones. So this might be getting things that people aren't, or maybe top down controlling to not show those facial expressions, but are being revealed to these um, autonomic arousal measures. And again, we see the same thing that this predicts um, social connection readings. Okay, now this one, I think we'll lose the final one, where uh, we can also ask like, what are your impressions? How do you like these characters? What do you think of them? And after, at the end of every episode, and we can project those into a lower dimensional space using PCA and also look at alignment there. And we see that, uh, they start aligning more over time, and the degree of alignment predicts connection, which grows over time as well. So, an interpretation. And then finally, if you put all of this stuff together into a structural equation model, uh, each of these things like independently um, contribute to a latent construct we're calling the shared experience that ultimately predict connection ratings. And that's controlling for time effects and other things as well. Okay, so this is just like a, a taste of like how we're using this in the lab, and then I'm going to go through some of, yeah exactly how we computed some of these in the paper for the tutorial part. But I guess before I get there, does people have questions about this at all? I move on. Yeah. Oh yeah. Troy. Sure. I mean, it's very uh, maybe not, but the if you start on this one, like the, the concepts of positive affect, how much do we less variability is also part of the one category? Yeah, so we have this, um, had a student who was working on this for a while and then left and it's kind of slowed down a bit, but we started looking at the degree of variation within valence uh, uh, for emotional experiences. And we've looked at it in terms of the actual feeling dimensions, appraisal dimensions, um, and we've been looking across about six or seven different data sets. So some are like looking at static images, some are looking at short films, some are looking at facial expressions, and we're also trying to add in brain activity as well. But so far, and it's not, not fully worked out where the paper's done, but it, so far we found that we see a much higher degree of synchrony and almost always uh, across the positive valence than the negative. So, and I think the why, there's many explanations. So one, one thing is it's much lower dimensional. Um, that's one. So there's many more possible ways to feel bad than, or at least to, yeah, well, probably to feel bad than to feel good. Um, and also your guys' lives, but maybe I have a lot more bad <laughs> experiences than good ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might be me in my appraisals, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but there can be a lot of reasons for that too. But I think it's, I haven't seen anyone like report that before. And I think it could be an interesting theoretical thing about at least if not for the nature of emotion itself, but how we're studying it. Other questions before we move on? Yeah. 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 So what, I guess my, it, this is, well, unfortunately being recorded, but I will edit this out later because I have control over that. Um, maybe a non-traditional or popular opinion about structural equation modeling as a culture rather than a technique. I think technique wise, there's no reason why you, you know, sample size, we should be able to figure this out or those types of things. But I think as a culture, the it's the more traditional area of psychology and it hasn't really evolved with all of the knowledge we have of methods and how they work as much as other disciplines like machine learning and, um, and, and prediction stuff. 
And so there's not a culture of like cross validation. Um, uh, there's so many different ways you can have so many models and how do you control for your number of models you're testing or different hypotheses and how independent are they and all that. There's all these issues there. And so I think people tend to make these sweeping claims of like, oh, you need to have like 20, you know, participants per parameter, and, you know, but there's no way to, that could be true, right? Like it's, it really depends on your data and how much noise there is and all that stuff. Um, so I think in general, when people are doing this, they're doing it on like questionnaire data and that questionnaire data is probably very noisy and not have a lot of strong capturing the true signal. Um, and so there's gonna be a lot of noise. So to get structural equation models that are reliable or to converge, it might require a lot more data for that type of uh, thing. Um, yeah, that, is, that was a little more politically correct than I expected, I would say, maybe. It's a little negative, but not, <laughs> not, uh, not Twitter reporting <laughs> video. Getting me canceled today. <laughs> uh, you know, I have lots of thoughts about the structural equation modeling. It's it's a weird tradition that it hasn't evolved as much as I. And I think partly it's because it's not honestly being taught a lot in the graduate programs as well. Okay. Other any last questions about structural equation modeling? Yeah. Or not? Sorry, not about structural equation modeling. <laughs> so I, I, the question may be weird because it's not really mm -hmm. but. But I'm still having a hard time like completely digesting why the MPSC has very low IMC, but then when you do HMM, there's a state aligned. Yeah. So for example, um if you imagine like the parietal regions where where you have like moderate level of IMC, and then you have you know that people's attention time portions are aligned like, as you watch the same movie, for example, mm -hmm. like like does that not have those kind of like state like um, time series? Like I'm curious, what is so special about the MPSC yeah. that it, it is showing such a different result compared to other brain regions? Yeah, and it's a great question. I actually love your example because part of the reason of you coming I was hoping I was asking you this exact question. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's not. That. <laughs> Um, but one of the things I've been wanting to chat with you about specifically is if we used your engagement models and applied it to this data set, will we see engagement increase here that corresponds to the, so let's say it's like a noisy thing that's happening and then like you have attention and that might have some gain on the signal that will increase it. Will we see greater resolution of the states or other things like that if it correlates with these other measures of like attention or engagement? Um, that's a hypothesis. I don't know if it's going to be true, but I think it probably will be. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is, the, if it is continuous and noisy, we've discretized it and simplified it and, and with these discrete states. And so it's forcing it to be something, even if it's not exactly the same, whereas it, like ISC and other things, it doesn't have the same assumptions. And then the third is that, you know, we showed low ISC, which means that all participants need to be time locked. And here I'm showing that in this discrete state, only half of the sample is, is time locked at the max, like where they're aligning. So that would never get to an ISC that would be very large if we looked at it that way. I think that's at least a few of the reasons why we can have both findings kind of coexist, but I think it's an open question to test the exact reasons why. Thanks. Okay, I'm just going to move on for the sake of time. Okay, so now on to the tutorial part. And okay, share screen first. Twitter book we've been making. Not all the tutorials are up and most of them need to be edited heavily. So we haven't really been showing you guys this yet. Mostly I just posted this like 10 minutes before we started. So uh, it was the only place I could quickly get it to you. Um, but if you go to tutorials.mindsummerschool.com, that will eventually have all the tutorials for this week and be hopefully cleaned up a little bit um, in terms of the, the more uh, uh, consistent format. And the one we're going to go to is on synchrony and alignment. And then, uh, well, I guess first, hopefully other people can get there. <laughs> okay, great. Um, okay, so this tutorial, we're gonna go over a couple of the examples of the analyses from the same data set. And there's a couple ways to go. So if you wanna take this notebook, you can just follow along in the book. Um, or you could download the notebook as a, as a Jupyter notebook. Um, you could also uh, start like a, a, a in Colab, um, so it can run it in real time. Um, so anyway, those are all the different ways you can go. So if we did do that.
Um, I'm not going to run it this way just because I haven't fully tested it. I'm just going to run it locally on my laptop. But you, you, if you want to follow along, we'll quickly find out if it works or not in the cloud. <laughs> It'll make it look like you guys don't know what you're doing instead of me not knowing what I'm doing. <laughs> it's pre-registering. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Maybe when the camera's off. <laughs> okay, so there's a little bit of background about you know what Synchrony is and how people have been using it a little bit. Um, so first is we I, there's also kind of recapitulates a lot of the points I just made in the slides about how we do summary statistics, how um, the difference between pairwise versus average for inner subject correlations. And then there's things that I didn't talk about um, um, in the slides, which I'm going to focus on just for a couple minutes here, which is how do you do hypothesis tests on synchrony? Um, it doesn't really, you can't really do, it doesn't meet the assumptions of parametric stats. You can't just do like a one sample T test or do a straight permutation where you exchange the, um, the rows of the matrix. Um, Okay, so first let's just uh, load all the modules we need. Um, it's a good, I have no idea what'll happen for you guys because I didn't test on Colab if these modules will all load automatically. Um, and to get the data, I've included two different ways, um, partially because some are easier on some computers than others and partially some are faster and also partially because the, the where we're putting the data wasn't ready until this morning. Um, so. One of them is I have all of like a summary of the average activity for each OR, a region of interest for across all the participants as CSV files that are on the GitHub repository. And I have some code snippets on how you can just um, loop over the subjects and download those CSV files um, and, and open them directly into, into Python. Um, another way you can do it is using what's called Data Lab, which is an open source tool developed by ER Kelchenko at Dartmouth, which is a, a kind of like a, like GitHub or Git for data rather than for code. Um, and it's actually gotten to be fairly usable. Um, uh, and although there's still some headaches now and then, but what's really neat about it is you can just, it has all the same concepts as Git. Um, it's based on something called Git Annex. And so you can clone um, a data set that's hosted on another computer. Um, so it could be in the cloud, it could be a server that you have access to. And then it basically builds a file tree with aliases to where all the files ought to be. And then you can selectively choose which data files you want to download and you can drop them, but you will always know what data is supposed to be there. So if you want to like do some tutorials and download some imaging data, but then you're like, I need to use my laptop for other things and you want to drop it, you can just do that and it'll free up space. Um, but then you can always go back. So I like that a lot. That's the example I'm going to use right now um, of the data lab version, because some of you might want to like use this data set for your, your project. So this is the Friday Night Lights imaging data set or one of them. Um, and so you, you can do this through the command line in a terminal, but you can also do it directly in Python. They have um, Python bindings, which is really nice. So you initialize the data set um, and then uh, that will basically install it at the location you choose. So for me, it's just in this folder in my downloads folder. Um, and then it will give you the file tree and then you can get any file you want. So I'm just getting all of the CSVs and that have already been pre-processed and denoised and all of that. And then I'm loading that. So it should happen pretty quick because it's already downloaded. Um, okay, and then um, we're gonna simplify. So what the CSV is, it's the average activity within a region of interest and the regions of interest come from a parcellation based on um, a bunch of data that's in Neurosyn. So these are, when 14,000 papers that present their findings, um, which regions co-activate across all those, regardless of what they're studying. And then this is just doing a dimensionality reduction or clustering and clustering on those. Um, so these are basically parcels or regions that are frequently reported together. Um, and that's the IDs of each um, column in, this, in these CSV files correspond to a different region. And then the rows are time, like each TR, which is about 45 minutes. Okay, so first, if you want to look at synchrony within a specific region, so like maybe the DMPFC is like a social region we might care about. Um, on the NeuroVault, there's like a, a list of what all the, what the imager indices are corresponding to each region. 
Um, but I'll, I just have some example ones, but you can just swap, the, uh, swap these out with other ones in play. And so let's just take the first two subjects and say, overall, if we look at average activity in this region, like how correlated are they with the Pearson correlation? Um, so I'm just like plotting so you can see the region. This is plotting um, these two subjects over time, the average activity in this region. And then this is just the correlation value of how correlated these is are. It's like an overall level of synchrony. So hopefully this isn't too overwhelming. Great. Uh, so we can scale this up and be like, well, let's not look at just two subjects. Let's just scale it up to uh, all 34, 35 subjects in this data set. So this is just a function to um, from those CSV files to pull out the column corresponding to your target ROI, which is the DMPFC in this example, and then just make a new data frame where they're all columns. So this is the DMPFC activity going down for each subject in the data frame. Um, okay, so, and then we can compute ISC by just putting this function into a function called ISC that we have in our one of our toolboxes for brain imaging called NL tools. Um, and before I kind of run that really quick, I want to tell you a little bit about how do you test statistical significance of, of um, if, if like if synchrony is significant or not. And there's a couple of ways to do it. So one is you can't, so if this is like the observed data in that activity, um, uh, let's just say this is for a single subject and we know the overall synchrony, um, this data that's not independent. So we can't just exchange it or randomly um, permute the, the labels of time because there's autocorrelation and other types of uh, temporal dependencies present in the data that would violate those assumptions. So one really easy way is you can just, what's called circle shifting. You can pick a random starting point um, and then make that the beginning and then just take whatever's left and tag it onto the end. So all of the, the any temporal structure in your data will be preserved, but now it's gonna be not time locked to the original version. So you can just do, and it's also a really fast um, uh, technique. So if you want to do permutations, it, it, will, it will be really, really quick in doing that. Um, and so then you can build up a distribution of circle shifting or, or breaking up the temporal locking of participant C to generate a null distribution of how much would you expect by chance given the temporal uh, dependencies in your data. And to confirm that, we can do a Fourier transform to look at the power spectrum of the original data versus the circle shifted, and it's identical because it's not changing any of that, those properties. Um, another way is, is a technique called phase randomization. So how this works is you take a, your, your data and you do um, um, project it into, into uh, frequency space and you look at what the, you scramble what the phase is and then you um, um, uh, turn it back into like time data. Um, and then you can also see, so we're preserving the overall like frequency or power spectrum, but we're offsetting the phase or, or the alignment of it. Um, and this is a little bit slower than circle shifting, but it works um, about the same um, or just as well, usually. Uh, right. So now we can run these really quick. So this is um, running ISC with circle shifting. And this isn't like instant. I mean, it's only took five seconds on my laptop. I'm curious to see how long it takes on Colab. But what we're doing is we're running the the intersubject correlation where we're taking the pairwise of all the subjects and taking the mean after we do a Fisher R to Z transformation. Um, and then we take the mean and then convert it back um, into the original um, R values. And we're doing circle shifting. We're running it 5,000 times to be able to get that distribution. And it comes out. So this is the overall ISC, which is 0 0.85. And then that allows us to give us a p-value of um, how significant that is. And in this stat circle, it's a dictionary. Um, where you can look at the IC, the p-value, you can look at the confidence intervals, or you can actually, it saves the full null distribution if you want to plot that and inspect it yourself. Okay, and then we can do the same for phase randomization. As you can see, it's definitely a little bit longer. Um, this one took about 13 seconds on my laptop, but you essentially get the exact same effect. So both of those are fairly, in my experience, fairly comparable to each other. Um, questions about these two techniques or why you would do it? The, one of the reasons I'm going in a little bit more detail about these, these particular ways you do it is because while this is true for this particular way of testing synchrony, 
these techniques are actually quite domain general. So you can apply them in lots of different ways once you get the concept of them. Um, I don't think so. Like for me, my preference is usually circle shifting. One, because I can explain it and understand it a lot easier. Um, and two, because it's, it's really fast. Okay, so like if there's non-stationary or other things that phase random stations maybe works better. That's good to know too. Um, other questions? Okay, so we'll move to the next one. So the third one, this was a, uh, a technique proposed by Gong Chen. Um, and he has a series of papers where he's a stat statistician at the NIH um, who started trying to figure out what are the stats and are we correcting for fault or it, is it actually um, uh, working the way we want for controlling false positive rates. Um, and so he proposed that um, another way to do this, which he says is better, I don't think that's ubiquitous at all across the field, um, is to do what's called subject-wise bootstrapping. Um, so the way this works is, and I think it's a really interesting idea, you um, basically, this is your pairwise similarity matrix. So we use, we take the summary like the mean or the median for the ISC, but then instead what you do is you recompute this, but you, so with those other methods, you have to redo it on the time series itself, where this technique is really interesting because you can, you only need to, you can run it on the time series if you want, but it's actually, you can, it's the exact same thing if you run it um, on the fully completed ISC matrix. So this actually ends up being a lot easier um, if you, especially if you have like a lot of data where you just work on this matrix rather than the time series data. And what you do is you resample with replacement participants and then um, so, and you can do that just by indices of where the subjects are. And then you create a new ISC matrix of that sample that's a bootstrap of it. But sometimes the same subject gets um, sampled multiple times. And so I think in the original paper, they just ignored that and used the median. Um, in our toolbox, we just turn those into NANs for those instances. So they don't like really drive skew your, your means. Um, and then you can take the ISC of that. And that's just one bootstrap. And you iterate over, you know, five, 10,000 times to get a distribution of bootstraps. So you can kind of get a, a sense of the confidence of what your ISC metric is. And then you can turn those into P values. Um, so you can go basically with the bootstrap, you're trying to generate a distribution, if you would generalize the cost of population, mm -hmm. what would the ISC would look like, as opposed to trying to do a null hypothesis testing, which is what you do with the presentation. So right. the, the, the stuff that you're generating is a little bit different. Yeah, they're different and they're used in certain ways. There is a like specific way in which they overlap and you can use them both ways, but yeah, that's, a, that's a good point. Value. Yeah, you can get a key value with it, but the goal of it the goals are different, and you can also use them in different ways beyond this just this hypothesis. Yeah, and also the uh, good equivalence is that the first two methods are more like a fixed effect. So you test the effect of the like the fixed effect of that ISC value, like mm -hmm. that R value, whatever it is. And this is more akin to a random effect where you're trying to like do something from the population. Not a bit equivalence, but it's yeah, a, that a, one I may mean, not fully. Agree with yeah, but maybe just for the sake of time, not get too deep into that. But yeah, but totally point taken that they're not exactly the same. Right. You yeah. could also just combine them, right? So mm -hmm. I mean, you can circle shift and bootstrap in the same yeah. procedure. You can bootstrap or circle shift the data. That's right. And yeah. then you can have that. You can have as much of both. Levels. Yes. And I haven't seen at least a comparison of all of them with, with that, that combined method, but that'd be interesting to see what happens. Um, but I will show you a little bit about what the distributions look like when you do them to show that they are, like Nir's pointing out, that they're very different. Um, so this is after we've run it 5,000 times for each of these three methods on the exact same data. Um, so red is like what our ISC that we observe, um, which is the same across all of them because it's using the exact same method and data. And then this is what the, the distribution looks like that each of the techniques find. So it's hard to see the difference between the circle shift and the phase randomization because they're virtually on top of each other and they're quite tight around zero. Um, and then the bootstrap one is also more or less centered at zero, but it has a much wider um, uh, variance um, around it. But all three of these techniques, at least for this particular IC, show that the, the, the red line exceeds pretty much every example. So they're highly significant, basically down to the precision of the amount of data we have, which is 0.002, I think, for this, this sample. Questions about this? This, I would say this technique has been a bit more controversial um, in the field. Uh, I wrote, um, this tutorial is based on another one I co-wrote with an, an, another um, person who strongly did not want to include it because he didn't believe that it worked. Um, 
but our compromise was I had the I was the Python side, so I got to write it, and he couldn't delete it because he couldn't boot a Python. Uh, I'm kidding. Yeah. No, we agreed, but he ended up inspiring him to do a bunch of simulations of work, which I think he's turning your paper to make his points too. Yeah, yeah. that's like yeah. Not the Python simulation seems like my model. Yeah, so I think um, I mean that just might be a uh, quirk. Like if we picked a different region, we might not see that. Um, or if we had more subjects or well subjects, we might see something different. There's nothing like inherent about it. I think what I like about all of these techniques, especially doing resampling methods in general, is they don't make any distributional assumptions. So they're they're basically allow you to make inferences without making distributional assumptions, which I actually think is wise most of the time. Usually when you're bootstrapping, you're bootstrapping like every unit. When you're terrible bootstrapping the person, you're going to call that person corresponds to the C matrix. So that tends to like lead to the situation where like pulling out one particularly influential subject might constitute a bunch of values around one. So you end up being more likely to see these sorts of like multi mode sort of distributions when you don't have an RMS. Yeah, that is yeah. a good question. I think it's a good question. Well, circle shifting does too. Yeah, I like you because you get such a lack of circle, right? So it's more exactly this is way more conservative, mm -hmm. which it just makes it more rigid. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you can see it's more conservative because yeah, the, yeah. the distribution is much wider. Yeah, yeah. 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 Guarantee to always be um, like wider. If, like if you had a sample of like say the human connectome project, you had a ton of people and you had very short tasks. I'm not sure that it actually. I think, yeah, I think that be the same. It could be reverse. Um, yeah, it's always at least as thing, but it can always be like not necessarily. I don't think there's a case where it's ever slide down. If you have like a tiny amount, I feel like if you have a tiny amount, like every subject is the same. Yeah, it's, it's, it's it be because it's like the, the within same. subject versus between subject. Yeah, yeah. If you have like a really short video, like a one minute long video, I feel like there's a case where it could be. Okay, but moving ahead and um. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, like, say you do data analysis and you write the paper, would you just pick one of these methods? Right? Yeah. Or Obviously, you're only going to pick the one that works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's up to you. I mean, in Running a stats paper compared to methods. If you're running a psych paper, who's the one who's supposed to be most appropriate and just do that? Yeah, I think a lot in practice because sometimes some of these, depending on your data and the thing, it can take a really long time to run. Especially this is we were just in one region, but if you did it over the whole brain, or and depending on if you're doing the voxel level or searchlights, or you know, it could take a really long time to do it. So often people just do it once. Um, I don't know. I don't even think I do it all the time, all the different ways. I kind of just pick one, whichever is faster that I can get the answer quicker with them very impatient like that. Um, but almost always a reviewer will mention something that you will have to run it other ways if they care. So there's like, I think people are more starting to recognize that all of these are probably are going to be okay. And also there's less like, um, like conflict, I think, of different groups that have proposed different methods Is there, that they're used to, they're used to be. I don't know if anyone else different advice. I'd probably just run the combined version. You can't rule out both. Yeah. Edge yeah. your best. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> 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 or I should say you're all partially right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we can do this over the whole brain. Um, so for this, I'm doing the circle shift one because it's faster. And I, yeah. It looks like I'm doing 5,000 samples. If you want to speed this up, you can decrease the number of samples you run. <clears throat> and then we can do uh, different types of plots. We can do one that's just like a axial montage. Um, so you can see this increase, just like I showed you, this is the exact finding from, from the exact data from the, the paper, but auditory and, and, and early visual are higher and all, mostly all, even a visual and auditory association cortex as well, but in the front of the brain, quite low. And we can do more interactive plots. Um, that we can so we can kind of scroll around and look at it to confirm that. Okay. And one of the reasons why, like, we have, Mesh um, and I have a paper on feature selection when you're doing multivariate stuff about from, you know, voxels and searchlights all the way to like whole brain stuff and about when and what are the costs and benefits of using these different types of representations of your data. 
Um, but one thing I like about personally starting with this 50 parcel one is it's very crude, um, but on for any corrections, 0.001. So it's quite easy to um, correct for multiple comparisons and, with, um, and see stuff in your data. And then sometimes I'll refine it and do you know finer grain parcelations or focus on specific regions. Okay, so I'm gonna try to do two more examples and then we'll wrap up and I'll go a little bit quicker. So this one, this is the most popular way people are using IC that I showed you. And this is all the issues and stats that people debated for the last 20 years, more or less on that topic. Um, but you might also be interested in time varying aspects of synchrony. And there's probably three ways that are the most common that I've seen this in the, in the literature. So one of them is using just a, a moving average, um, which is the one that most people you'll probably see. Um, there's a lot of each of the ways of doing it has makes some assumptions and there's some problems and benefits of each of them. Another way is using what's called phase synchrony. So this kind of comes from um, the EG literature. And um, there's a really nice paper by Enrico Glarian et al, uh, where they outline this method of trying to show instead of just looking at synchrony across trials, like in phase, you can look at synchrony across participants in the same way. Um, and then the third way of doing it is what I showed you in that in the slides, which was you can look at the spatial activation and see how similar they are um, at every TR. Mm -hmm. um. That might not be a huge problem. Yeah, so I think that it, it's really dependent probably on the data you're using and, and also what types of assumptions you want to make. But yeah, I think smoothing could be the way that I have implemented this um, phase thing is that it does, you do some degree of filtering for a specific frequency band and then you do a Hilbert transform to get the angle um, out. And there's, depending on your data, you would definitely want to pre-process, but um, I personally wouldn't temporally smooth it if you're using this method, but if you're using a moving average, then that's by definition what you're doing is, is a temporal smoothing. Um, but depending on the time scale, it's the moving out. That's the, one of the problems with the moving average is that if you use a rectangle as your kernel, so this is like, you have like something that's varying and then you apply it, you know, like a box car as a kernel. So essentially what you're saying is let's take the average here as one value, and then let's just move this box forward and convolve it with the rest of the signal. And so that's just going to give you a, a user overlapping, um, but what the overall um, window is. But this depending on this seems you're weighting everything equally. You could do other kernels. It could be like a triangle or a Gaussian um, that will weight them in proportional to work the distance of it. Um, but one problem with this is that uh, the width of your of your window determines the time scale of effects you can see. And, um, and in phase synchrony, it's the exact same thing by predetermining which filter, which frequency range you're looking at, which corresponds to like a certain width. Um, and in phase synchrony, at least in that um, literature, it's more common to try multiple windows to look at times like hot, fast, and slow time scales. Where in moving averages, I don't tend to see people report both results. Um, but that's just to keep that in mind. That's some of the reasons why uh, you can get really different results with moving averages. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Okay, so basically what we did was we, for the whole, all 35 subjects, we computed um, for a specific frequency band uh, what the overall synchrony is over time. And this, just for memory, I just made it pretty small. So we're we're just seeing it. Um, unfold over like a like 50 or 100 TRs. And so basically, um, when you have like an oscillatory signal, um, you can think of it as like there's so there's sines and cosines, you have know that, so it's just offset and phase. Um, but then if you were to rotate this um, and then think about time in like a in like a magic or complex phase, um, basically it's like spinning around in a circle. Um, that's the sine and the cosine going. And the direction you're facing is the, is the angle. And that's like the phase, essentially phase offset a little bit. So what this is, is like, if you take, if every line here is a subject um, and that's the phase angle at that moment in time, um, the more subjects that are facing the same direction means higher synchrony. And we just take the resultant vector of, of what that is. And that's basically being computed here. Um, so you can see it gets small when they're all out of phase and then it starts getting longer. It's, if it's one, it means they're perfectly in alignment. Uh, and they're facing the same direction. And for this, at least part of the data in this data set, it never gets that high, maybe up to 0.5. So it still kind of looks pretty messy. Um, but if we looked at different frequency pans and stuff, you might see something different. Okay, so we can uh, loop over different frequency bands. Um, 
or we can look at one frequency band and do that over the whole brain. Um, and you basically, it looks very, very similar to, and essentially if you take the mean of it, it's almost identical to doing the average uh, synchrony like we were doing earlier. Um, and then, but what's neat that you can't do in the other ones is start looking at what about when in time and also a different frequency band. So this is a, a, a time frequency plot of intersubject correlation or phase synchrony. So I just made um, like a small set of, I think it's 20 or 25 uh, different um, bins from the fastest we can do, which is our Nyquist frequency. So half the sampling rate. So here that's about uh, 0.25 Hertz. And then we just make linear bins out to some small things. And then we're calculating the phase synchrony over the whole movie. So you can see in minutes where it is and around those scenes where the star quarterback is hit in this DMPFC region and some of the lower frequencies, you're seeing that people are aligning more there. Um, uh, so you might notice that like this isn't perfectly smooth and that's just because of the shape of the filter we're using for the, um, the extraction. But if we use different filters, it would probably blur together more. Okay, hypothesis testing, I'm just gonna say really quick. Um, uh, this is something that I learned from Jeremy about circle statistics, which are like parametric statistics, but on a circle, um, on a polar coordinates um, space. And you can, there's like analytic solutions that are equivalent uh, on, if you make these parametric assumptions. So one's called the Rayleigh statistic, and that can assess like, um, if you're, if you have a bunch of subjects that are at these different angles, like what's the distribution of these along? And is it uniform around, or is it more kind of like clustered or grouped facing a certain direction? And this is like an analytic solution, assuming some things about how to compute what that is. So you can simulate what the p-value should be for different um, uh, numbers of participants. This is if we did it for the same sample size. And it ends up to control, at least for an alpha of 0.05, that ends up being about a p of 0.3, or sorry, an r-value of 0.3. Um, but this is not going to control for multiple comparisons. So I just want to point it out that you can do this, but um, there's a lot more nuance, I think, in how you do it in practice. So I'm just going to show you really quick of what if we did this at the whole brain at these different frequency bands, like what do we see? And there's been a couple of papers that reported this one really nice one was this Kauke paper. That there's a reference if you want to look at it um, in which higher frequencies you start seeing. You, it's usually more like um, primary cortex so that here you're seeing more in the auditory. And then as you go to lower frequencies, you start seeing signals that um, are more um, aligning in, 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 in the front of the brain as well which I think is a really interesting thing. We've replicated their findings as well. Okay, so, so I'm gonna just do one last thing, which is about, I've talked all about aligning in a temporal sense, but we can also align to any arbitrary feature space. And just a really simple one when we're doing fMRI is just space. So what's the activity in each region or voxels within a region? So just to make the tutorial go fast and, not have to reload data to look at a specific region to look at patterns within a region. We're just going to treat um, the embedding space as 50 dimensions, which corresponds to the activity in each of these parcels um, for every subject. And so this is um, uh, for two subjects, just the pairwise similarity, and this is not intended to be here. I'm not sure what that is. Let's skip that. This is what, no, let's see if this one works. Okay, this one's really slow. I, there might be a reason why I did that one. So this is doing this now for every TR, but if you did it for a single TR, you can get how much in space they align for these 50 TRs. And then now this is just iterating over, you know, I think like 1400 TRs. Um, and then that gives us this plot here, which is how much, um, at least over the whole brain at this really core spatial scale, um, how much uh, subjects are aligning at every time point in the, in the movie. And this is identical, except we did it within the regions and the paper. This is across regions. Okay, so the last concept I want to say is that this is, I think, really powerful because you can extend this concept of synchrony alignment to any feature space. But maybe you're like, okay, there's so many features. I actually want to do it in a lower dimensional space. Um, so, like, what if we could do this with like a PCA component where we reduce the features, but we do the feature reduction not for every subject independently, but on that which they align the most in. Um, so this is a thing I think a lot of people want to know how to do, and there's it's I've never found a great example in any stats book of how to do this um, idea. And the one I'm proposing that you should try is um, comes from this functional alignment literature like hyperalignment. 
And the one that we use a lot in our lab is called the shared response model, which was developed at Princeton and, and Peter Romage's group. And it's basically, they have two different implementations, but you can think of it like a joint PCA, where you're doing a PCA for every subject separately, but you're, the, the solutions it finds are the one that best works for everybody. Um, so when you, when you do your reduction, the component space is aligned, but then you get a separate projection into that space for every subject. Um, so we're just going to walk through a little bit what that looks like and then wrap up for lunch. Okay, so for this one, I'm going to... We're going to use the same data so that we just did for the spatial one. Um, so this is all of the ROIs, um, the 50 ROIs. And then um, just for really simplicity for plotting and everything, I'm just going to reduce the dimensionality a lot to five. The max dimensionality is either the number of um, subjects you have or the number of time points you have. Sorry, the number, it's whatever smaller is your degrees. That's the most amount of components you can use. Um, so we're going to do five. And you basically just need to give it a, either a list of brain data objects, which is in NL tools. And you know, if you have questions, I can chat with you about that. Or you can just give it any NumPy matrix, as long as the alignment side, which is here is time, um, is a, a constant. So we're basically going to figure out how to map people into a common space, a common, sorry, brain space based on uh, similarity in the temporal dynamics um, using SRM. And we reduce it down to the five components. And this is the intersubject correlation of those components once we've projected every subject in, or, or transformed every subject. And you can see this fifth one is the one that has the highest ISC. So again, just totally arbitrary, but we're just gonna inspect that one a little bit further. So um, we'll just pick that component, which is number four. And then now we're plotting, uh, once we've transformed every subject into this latent space, um, what on average is happening. And so the mean is in dark and you can kind of see the variation across subjects. Um, but you can kind of see why this has a high IC because they're coupling quite, quite nicely. Um, and what's neat about this technique now is that we can start seeing like, what are the brain regions for every subject that are projecting into this common space? And I think because of the little, you know, really constrained by the example where we're taking these like, high level differences of regions. So like the average activity in each of these different parcels, um, they're largely the same across the participants. And it's looking like it's some temporal cortex, auditory cortexing, but the specific weights or contributions across participants from these regions are, are actually different, even though they're, they're projecting to a common space. So if you were doing much more fine grained stuff like the voxels or, or you know, surface um, level things, uh, vertices, uh, you might see much more variation across participants that's aligning them. Um, but for this one, because uh, like at a low spatial frequency of how brain information is being processed, you're not seeing a huge variation um, with this particular example. Okay, so this is the exact technique we use for the facial expression thing that I showed you in the slides, and also for the cross experiment alignment. Um, there, it's using this exact code to do that. I'm just applying it in this like spatial way right now. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so does it sort of get at like when it be synchronized can certain states that are in their brains, but like there might not be the same contribution of certain areas That's right. in that state. So it's like everyone has kind of a unique state. So there's something shared, but like everyone is sort of idiosyncratic in that state. Exactly. So again, like like the Trump, you know, Biden election, when Biden wins, half, well, 70% of the country is excited. And there's the, the MAGA lovers who are like opposite, so that you would see that the, they're time locked in time, but the weights of how you're projecting order is very different. You're, you're even going to get sign flipping in that example. Yeah, but that's exactly like the way I've been thinking about it. Other questions? So there's other ways to do alignments. The one that I will add to this tutorial at some point, just didn't make it for today, is dynamic time warping. So that's like if you want to align and you're kind of off in time a little bit, and there's a lot of ways to do it. And there's, um, um, and it's, a, I think it's interesting technique Talia uses that a lot in her work. Um, but for now, I think this covers the, the a wide space of ways you might apply this, this concept to your data. So anyway, the, the, I'm not sure if any of the code worked on your thing, but it hopefully it will when you, when you download it. So maybe we got stuck at downloading data, maybe. Okay, so there's probably some dependencies like uh, data lab or stuff you might need to install on your computer, which is a little bit harder. But if you switch to the GitHub one, if you paste that code in the cell and run, it should run and everything else should work, hopefully. Um, but I'm happy to help you when that, like later this afternoon or whenever you guys are playing with it too. All right, thanks. Let's go get some food. <laughs>